Welcome to the first lecture video for Chapter 9. And um, out of all of the online lecturing that we're doing, um, this is the one that I kind of wish we had been able to do in class the most. Um, there's a lot of really nice demonstrations, simple and, um, and otherwise, that help us think about um, the idea of rotation and what we're going to be talking about for these these new ideas of statics and torque. But we're here and um, the, the best thing I can do is to urge you to try to find stuff around your um, house or apartment and uh, try to think about the somewhat simple little experiments that we're going to either be seeing on the video or thinking about and see if you can set up um, things that are balanced or rotating um, at home. So this first video is introducing us to the idea of what we mean by these new terms. Static equilibrium is actually something that we thought about very briefly in chapter four when we had um, problems that looked like this with uh, multiple ropes holding onto a block. And if we think about what happens here, if we cut one of the two ropes, that thing will start to swing and it will swing by rotating in a circular motion kind of way. So the problems that we talked about in chapter four, they weren't moving and the only thing we really had to do to, um, to figure them out is to look at the forces adding up to zero. But we will see situations where just looking at the forces isn't enough for us to be able to solve the problem. We have to think about this new idea of torque as well. So the first thing that we can think about is um, rotation. So the fact that um, you are stuck at home and um, not seeing this in class doesn't have to stop us. You can get any kind of pen, pencil, writing implement. And I want us to think about all the different possible ways that we could hold this um, with just one hand and even just touching it with one finger or two fingers um, that will allow it to not rotate. So I want you to pause the video and try a couple of different um, places where you can hold on to this pen or pencil. So pause the video, try it on your own, and then I'll show us a couple. Okay. So first of all, a lot of you might have tried to balance it in the middle, and that's a really common thing to, to do. And one thing that you'll have um, noticed, especially if you have a pencil maybe with um, a like metal piece at the end and a um, denser um, eraser, you might not have been in the physical middle of the pencil, but wherever you're touching it to balance it is gonna be what's called the center of mass or center of gravity. And that will be something that we think about in this chapter um, a little bit later on. The other thing that you might have realized is that you can hold it um, with two fingers, one on top and one on the bottom. But something I want us to consider, whether we did or didn't already, is that they don't have to be right next to each other, right? I could hold it if I'm kind of at the same point, I can hold it top and bottom anywhere along that pencil and it will work or pen. But we can also hold it in two different spots and have it still work as well. However, it is not any two spots. I'm going to have this uh, hand to help me out. But imagine if I let go with this um, second hand here that has my watch on it. And I'm only trying to hold it with two uh, points just like before. Before, when I was holding it like this, it would have worked, but now it won't. And it didn't just drop, it rotated. So I'm gonna do it one more time, but if you still need to convince yourself, you can rewind. I'm not gonna keep um, dropping my pen on the floor. But if I let go here and I'm holding on with these two points, it doesn't just drop straight down, it rotates. And so whatever I was doing in that last example, was causing some rotation. It wasn't allowing the thing to be in what we'll call static equilibrium, not moving and not rotating. Now it's worth noting uh, right away here that when we use the word rotation in physics, we specifically mean a change to the angular velocity. We were introduced to this idea of angular velocity omega back in chapter six. And it is worth recognizing that because we are talking about a change to a velocity, we are talking about an acceleration. We have not yet introduced the idea of angular acceleration, and we won't in this chapter. That's a topic in chapter 10, so that'll be something we see very soon. 
uh, but it's something to keep in mind uh, even now when we're talking about rotation. So when we think about something rotating, whether it's a wheel that is spinning in place, whether it is a door that either swings open from one single hinge or a revolving door that kind of swings around in the middle, there is a point, and it might not be a single point, it might be a, a vertical line or axis where everything seems to be rotating around. That is something we will have to be working with all throughout this chapter, thinking about what we mean by an axis. <coughs> okay, so let's imagine that, um, let's imagine that I have this pencil here, okay, and um, with this hand I need to rotate it. So I need to push on the pencil, right? We know that already, that I can't just stare at this pencil. That would be cool if I could just stare at it and have it rotate. I need to push on the pencil, but I need to push on the pencil in a very specific way. I can't push right here at the axis and have it rotate. So I have to push somewhere that isn't at the axis. I can't just push here and have it rotate. I can't be pushing towards the axis, even though I'm a, kind of far away, that force still isn't gonna do anything. And so I need to push perpendicular to that axis to cause rotation. So we need to have a force. I need to push on this pencil to get it to rotate. I need to not push at it at the axis, right? The same direction of push at the axis won't work while away from the axis will work. And that distance away has to be um, not pointing at the axis um, and uh, it needs to be perpendicular. The distance has to be perpendicular to the push. So to make a nice little list for us to think about and probably write down in our notes, to have rotation, we need to have a force. We need to have that force be um, acting somewhere away from the axis of rotation. And we need that force to be um, perpendicular in some way or that distance to be perpendicular to the force. So force, distance, and this idea of perpendicular in the right way. I mentioned at the start of this video that one of the things that makes me sad about having to record this is in lecture, I actually hang off of a door to make sure we recognize that it's not just um, applying a force and it's not just applying a force a distance away from the axis, but this idea of perpendicular in the right way means there's only really one way to open and close a door. So we'll have to imagine that. Now, for the equation itself that we're going to be using, if you look in the textbook, um, it uses pretty standard physics notation um, for our level of physics, algebra-based physics, which is R, the distance, F, the force, and the sine of theta, where theta is the angle between those two things. We do need to recognize, though, that um, we need to be really, really careful about this idea of perpendicular. And so we will not use that equation at all. I don't really want us to think about that because then we're going to focus too hard on what that sine of theta means when the situation might be where the cosine makes more sense based on where that angle is. So instead, we have a pair of equations that we're going to be thinking about. That torque, which uses the Greek letter tau, can either be the perpendicular part of the force times the full distance to the axis, our axis, or we could write torque as the entire force times the perpendicular distance to the axis, our perp. We will see examples where one or both of these um, can be used, where one of them makes more sense in the situation or the other. But in both cases, the general idea in words is that torque is force times distance, but we have to include that idea of perpendicular in the appropriate way. So torque is the rotational ability of a force, and it's really kind of the rotational equivalent of force. One way that we could think about that is that force causes motion. If I push on something, it will move. If I push on something that causes a torque, it will rotate. So this picture here with um, a merry-go-round, on the left of our slide, we have a kid who has not taken physics and doesn't know how merry-go-rounds work. And he's just trying to like pull away from the axis, right? He is a certain distance from the axis, but his force is parallel 
to the distance that he is. The distance is R and it's kind of in blue here, although the colors are hard to see. And the force is red. There's no part of that force that is sideways um, the way he needs it to be. But instead, if he is able to pull at an angle, any kind of angle here, at least part of that force will allow the um, merry-go-round to start rotating because the part that is perpendicular in this particular situation is F sine theta, where we see where the book specifically put theta. And it's worth making sure we understand that we could have seen theta in a different spot and then sine wouldn't have necessarily been the correct thing for us. So that's why we're using this idea of perpendicular force rather than relying on correctly guessing sine or cosine in any given situation. Okay, so let's consider three different ways that we could apply a force to a door. And if you have a door nearby, um, maybe you can even set up these three different situations to think about um, which one is actually opening the door the easiest. So this first example, we are pushing on our slide, we're pushing up and we are a sideways distance um, from the hinge. So for that sideways distance of 0.8 meters of um, horizontal distance, and the force going up and down of 20 newtons, perpendicular is already built into this problem. And so all we have to do is take 20 and multiply it by 0.8. So in this first example, so I'm going to get out my whiteboard and then I'll show it to us. In this first example, we have um, the door and we're pushing on it. And so the torque is the perpendicular force, which conveniently is all of it, times the distance to the axis. And so we have 20 newtons times 0 0.8 meters. And when we plug that in, we get 16 newton meters. Okay. So our ability to rotate that door, the amount of ability we have for rotation is 16 newton meters. It's worth recognizing that that unit just comes from the fact that we're multiplying newtons times meters. There's no fancy extra um, named unit to have. We're going to be talking about newton meters quite a bit in this chapter. If instead we pushed towards the hinge, so now we have um, a situation towards the hinge. I'm going to draw that on the board too. Then the perpendicular force, when we think about that perpendicular force, even though we are still, um, even though we are still 0.8 meters away, the perpendicular force is zero newtons. And so our torque is zero newton meters. If you try pushing on a door towards the axis, if you try pushing on a door towards the axis, you're not going to be able to rotate it. You're going to have zero um, ability to rotate the door that way. And then this third example, I want you to try on your own. Um, so even if you didn't pause for the previous two, I want you to try this one on your own um, and see if it makes sense to you. So set up the picture in your notes, um, set up the equation, uh, and to give yourself as much time as you need, just pause the video. So in this case, the perpendicular force is actually a um, cosine term here, which is why we want to make sure we understand that that um, textbook notation of sine, um, sine of the angle, that comes from a cross product in calculus. If we don't understand that calculus um, source, then we can't actually really understand why the book is expecting a particular angle, which in this situation wouldn't be the 60 degrees, it would be the 30 degrees. So what we have is 20 newtons times the cosine of 60 degrees times the distance to the axis, which is 0.8 meters, and we get um, 8 newton meters. So in blue here in the corner, We have that if we push at an angle for the door, it will, it will rotate. It will just rotate um, less quickly than if we push on the door the way that we're kind of accustomed to, just pushing it perpendicular. Okay, so um, torque is 
the force times the distance, this slide kind of has that list of all of the possible tools that we've seen in words so far and the unit reminder for us. And it's worth recognizing that so far we haven't really used the second one, the whole force times the perpendicular distance. Sometimes that perpendicular distance is called the lever arm um, of a force. And in this picture here where someone is, um, is trying to use a wrench to rotate um, something, there's that R with the perpendicular um, symbol, and that would be the, the lever arm. Um, it's basically the, the distance to the dashed line, which is where the force is acting um, vector-wise the distance to that line. And we see where the angle is. And that we could use the full distance and the perpendicular part of the force, or we could use the full force and the perpendicular component of the distance. Okay, so with these introductory examples, they're small enough and quick enough that we aren't gonna have separate videos. But for each one of these, I want you to pause, I really do want you to pause the video and try it on your own. That's the best chance that you have to see if things are making sense or not. No one is watching you and judging you if you're wrong, but this is a chance to see if things are making sense to us or not. So you uh, can pause the video. I'm going to do it on the board here and then um, come back and talk about it. In this case, we're going to use the perpendicular part of the force times the full distance to the axis. And it's worth recognizing um, right away in the picture that the part of the force that is perpendicular is the um, component that I've circled here. Because if we just rotate our page of the whiteboard, we don't care about the 50 degree angle that is in the picture. All we care about is there's this 30 degree angle um, between where the distance is and where the force is. So the perpendicular force then is going to be the 20 Newton force times the sine of 30 degrees, we are away from that 30 degree angle, times the two meter distance. And so 20 times sine of 30 degrees is 10, times two is 20 Newton meters. You can confirm that um, for yourself on your calculator. And the trick here was simply recognizing that um, the easiest thing to do is kind of rotate our page to see why that 50 degree angle doesn't matter because all we care about is how the force um, is angled relative to the bar. Okay. For the next example, same idea. I want you to pause the video and try this one on your own first, especially if you got the first one wrong or you weren't sure how to do it or you didn't even pause the video for the first one, which, you know, I'm not there to judge you, but it is really a good idea to try it on your own first. Uh, it gives us a chance to make mistakes when no one's watching and no one's um, uh, grading anything, but it gives us a chance to see if things are making sense or not. Okay, so for this one, there's a bit of a difference here that I want us to, um, to notice. So first of all, that force, the entire force, is straight up and down, 40 newtons. And so if we want the perpendicular distance to that force, I'm about to um, show us on our whiteboard. If we want the perpendicular distance to that force, an up and down force means we need the side to side distance. We cannot, cannot just take the 40 newtons times the 3 meters because then we're completely ignoring this idea of perpendicular. So even though the top of the um, slide says force times distance, that's that general idea that torque still needs to care about perpendicular, which is why we have those two bolded larger um, tools to use. So we can use the entire force because it's up and down because we want this side to side distance. And the side-to-side -side distance here, when we think about this as one big triangle, so let's watch me draw it, this angle we're told is 35 degrees, and the hypotenuse here is 3 meters. 
So the perpendicular distance is 3 meters, and then in this case it's cosine, cosine 35 degrees. So then when we are trying to calculate the torque, the torque here is the whole force times the perpendicular distance. And so we have 40 newtons times 3 cosine 35 degrees. So I'll say the number out loud. I'm going to set this down, though. Um, so hopefully this is at least mostly in frame. But we need to include that angle, um, and we can't just rely on assuming that it's always going to be the sine component, because often it will not be based on the information that we have in the problem. Okay, 40 times 3 times the cosine of 35 degrees gives us 98.3 um, newton meters. So I'll write that down for completion's sake, 98.3 newton meters for this introductory example number 2. Okay. So for the next example, again, these are all somewhat small and we're training ourselves on how to use torque. It may be worth making a note to yourself to rewatch this portion of the, um, this lecture video if we do feel like we're struggling here. Okay, so another one for us where let's talk through it together, although you can certainly pause um, and try it on your own. But if we're struggling, let's talk through what we're seeing together. So first of all, right away, we see that our force is perfectly sideways. It is directly to the side, which means that we can call that our entire force, our whole force of 30 newtons. And now what we're looking for is the perpendicular distance. If we have a side-to-side -side force, we need a perpendicular distance of up and down. So I've drawn it on the board before we really do much. So this idea that we have a side-to-side -side, um, force, which means we need an up and down distance. And we have this angle of 65 degrees. And so if we look at this as a triangle again, where the hypotenuse is 3 meters, then the perpendicular, the perpendicular distance is the hypotenuse 3, since we're away from the angle, it will be sine of 65 degrees. And so the torque is the whole force times the perpendicular piece and so we plug all that into our calculator. And we get 81.6, 81.6 Newton meters. Okay, so again, yeah, hopefully it's all in frame. Let's try to get it slightly closer and partially in frame. A couple of things to note here so far. We will never take a part of the force and a part of the distance. We either have the entire distance times a part of the force or an entire force and part of the distance. But we should never ever have two sine or two cosine or a sine and a cosine in the same problem. That may be worth writing down because it's a mistake I often see, especially if we go back a couple of slides, especially for this first example that we did. A lot of students want to take um, the cosine of 50 degrees and the sine of 30 degrees, and we need to recognize that's not how we solve that problem. We just care about the relative angle. If you are taking two pieces, F perp and R perp somehow, you are actually missing a different piece of the, the torque. So we'll never have two sine or two cosine components. Okay, so we just did this one. It was 81.6 Newton meters. And for this last one, I want you to pause the video and think about it. I'm not even going to draw it out on the board. We will talk about it, but pause the video, um, and I'm going to get some water.
Okay. So hopefully, I'm gonna use some exciting cherry splash um, flavoring. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we knew that it wasn't some um, exciting exotic drink. Okay, so hopefully with this one, we saw that the force is up and down. We want the side to side distance, but really important, we don't want the full three meters. We just want the distance between where the axis is and where the force is acting, which is gonna be 1.5 meters halfway from the edge to the center instead of from edge to edge. So 25 times 1.5 is gonna give us 37 0.5 Newton meters, and that would be the answer for this one here. So <coughs> throughout these different examples so far, it's worth re-watching the video if you weren't really writing them down or if you were trying them but making mistakes, it will be worth re-watching this in a couple of days to see if you make the same mistakes. Each time we may be using one of these two example um, ways to write out torque or the other depending on how the situation itself is set up. Is it gonna be easier to find the perpendicular part of the force, or is it gonna be easier to find the perpendicular part of the distance? And functionally, you can always kind of rotate the problem and use the other one that you didn't choose um, the first time. So as this notes, um, it may be easier to use one of these or the other, depending on where your axis actually is, um, but they mean the same thing fundamentally. <clears throat> the other thing that we want to note is that torques have directions. Um, they are actually a vector. In chapter um, 10, we may or may not get into more details about how that vector is, is really actually dis defined or described in um, physics. But for chapter 9, all throughout, we are just going to think about clockwise versus counterclockwise. So for this example, um, we have two very odd circular looking children um, on a seesaw. And if we consider just one of them at a time, if child two jumps off the seesaw, then child one has their force acting downwards on the seesaw, the whole thing will rotate and it will rotate in a counterclockwise direction. If instead child one is the one that jumps off, then child two's weight is pulling down on the seesaw and it will rotate the opposite direction. That's what we mean by clockwise and counterclockwise. And that's how we're going to approach problem solving, which we will see in the next video. So it may be worth drawing this out completely so that we kind of have a sense of clockwise and counterclockwise. Uh, and we will see how these full chapter nine problems look in the next lecture video and then in all of these different example problem videos that we're going to see. So that's it for now. I will see you in the next video.